And so we got together as Seattle 7 working together. We organized 36 Northwest writers, all nationally published. Right. Good, credible writers. Good, credible writers. We have uh, Jamie Ford, uh, Hotel on the Corner, Bitter and Sweet, um, Elizabeth George, who's very well known, uh, Eric Larson, Devil in the White City. Um, we've got Nancy Rawls uh, for My Gym and Susan Wiggs on, from Bainbridge Island. All these great writers. And everyone's, we're doing it six days. 12 hours a day, two hour stints behind the wheel of the computer, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna uh, write a novel in six days, a full length 60,000 word novel in six days at Hugo House from October 11th through the 16th. We're writing 12 hours a day from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., and it will be uh, open to the public at any time. They can come in and watch someone write, and uh, it's also gonna be simulcast on the web with the webcam on the author and uh, live streaming text and a chat feature. Um, and we're also doing some fun stuff with auctioning off naming rights, mm -hmm. character naming rights. Uh, <laughs> so that if you, let's say. Brought to you by the good folks at Safeco. Uh, <laughs> well, no, 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 no. Let's say that you like really didn't like your fifth grade teacher mm -hmm. and you wanted to have him killed in a brutal way. Mm -hmm. you, you could, we'll have Kevin O'Brien kill that character for you. Wow. Kevin O'Brien writes great thrillers, mm -hmm. so he's really good at killing people. He'll, he can kill a lot of them. <laughs> and so you'll make a bid, and uh, the proceeds go to literacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you can say, I want Joe Smith, or whatever your teacher's name was, mm -hmm. and we'll introduce the character in the book, and we'll have him killed for you. <laughs> so, And you can also get the love interest, if you'd prefer that. Right. And so we have all these different kinds of things that you can... Uh, you can you can bid on, and that's at an opening party that's going to be at Elliott Bay Books mm -hmm. on Sunday, October 10th in the evening, oh. and so people can come and bid on. Nancy Pearl is going to be our MC for that. Wow. So. Now, how, how, is there any plotting going on for this, or yes. any? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, a, a, a true what they call exquisite corpse is mm -hmm. the idea. The surrealists came up with it. Mm -hmm. A true exquisite corpse is you don't see what came before you. you right. Start like that. Uh, we're actually going to try and make a readable novel mm -hmm. because we have, <laughs> believe it or not, for believe those it or don't, do still read. Because yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it, we have plans to have it published uh, as an ebook in the spring. Uh, we'll do some editing on it and actually make it good. A mm -hmm. 36 author collaborative novel. Um, so we have a, a committee of five uh, authors who will be kind of the editorial supervisors mm -hmm. and come up with a loose plot line mm -hmm. and then make suggestions. But when you sit down at the typewriter or at the computer for two hours, you, you, you're, you're on your own. You don't have to do. But there will be, uh, you'll get a tear sheet saying, here's where we are, here's where we'd like to head. So right. try and do that. But if you, you don't have to. There are only a couple rules. No chainsaws and no and then I woke ups. Okay. okay, so you can't do any of that okay. as an author. Otherwise, whatever you want. No chainsaws. Well, yeah, yeah. It's just something too brutal about a chainsaw. <laughs> That's where you draw the line? We, yeah, fire axe, no problem. <laughs> chainsaws, uh-uh. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, I gotta say, David Lasky mm -hmm. and uh, Greg Stump are gonna be doing a graphic novel portion of the book. Wow. So they're actually gonna be drawing it and we'll be scanning it in on the internet. As it goes along. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that cool? That is cool. It's going to be great. Now, how's that going to help literacy again? <laughs> <laughs> it's totally not, but... <laughs> well, you know what? What it's going to do, it's going to energize the community. We're going to get getting a lot of press for it. So it's going to energize sort of the reading and writing communities to come and see the transparency of the process. Every author is allowed and indeed encouraged to use lifelines. So we're going to have a speakerphone on the desk, and we'd like them to call their agent or their spouse or their... Or Stephen King. Or Stephen King. <laughs> it's true. Uh, we're going to be calling different writers mm -hmm. and editors and so forth and saying, hey, what should I? So that we get to see sort of the process of what it is, what a novel writer really, really goes through when writing. Uh, so in that sense, there's education. We're also running field trips through. Uh, two field trips a day from high schools are going to mm -hmm. be coming in, and they'll get to see and talk to the author and then do a writing program um, separately. And then we also have created an online virtual uh, sort of field trip so that if you can't make it in, teachers can log on and they can download the information and they can teach the segment in their class while they're watching parts of it on the internet. Uh, and as well, it's a fundraiser. So the, the whole venture is being underwritten by Amazon.com. Thank you, Amazon.com. Uh -huh. And so we don't have to worry about any of the expenses and any proceeds that we get from selling t-shirts or you know, character naming rights, uh, <laughs> will go directly to uh, supporting writers in the schools and also supporting Hugo House, who's hosting it at their uh, facility on Capitol Hill. So this sounds like it makes literacy sexy in a certain Absolutely way. Absolutely sexy. Which, which I like. 
let's go to the other side of it because it used to it used to be that if you were illiterate, there was a stigma attached to that. Mm, like yes. it really was a terrible thing. Now it doesn't seem to be as as stigmatized as it used to be. Do we need to shame people more for their illiteracy? I'm not sure that it's. I'm not sure that that's just your perception of it. I mean, I think that you know if you're if there's a real a, a true illiterate would feel, feel very compromised and have a very difficult time in this world. Um, so I'm not sure that that has changed. I think that it's just gone underground and perhaps, you know, we all, our circles of, of you know, p where we travel, the people we travel with are all kind of somewhat insulated and we, mm -hmm. we kind of hang out with our other educated friends. But I think that, uh, I think there is a stigma there. I, I think I might have to disagree with that. Really? You think there still is a stigma? Yeah. You don't, you don't think so? I don't think so. I mean, maybe if you're truly, truly, completely illiterate. But, if, I mean, even if you're, I, I think well, there are many the, where's the, functionally where's illiterate the, people who should be shamed. Maybe put in a stockade or something. Really? A stockade? <laughs> this is the best I could come you up with. You know, we could, uh, <laughs> now that I think about it, we could do something with a novel live with a stockade. I like that. I think that might be fun. <laughs> I'm not volunteering, however. <laughs> <laughs> But if, but seriously, I mean, if you take a look at, at the way kids write, I mean, like there's a there's a bunch of stuff. Is you see papers by high school kids, college kids, even people that right. I work with who can no longer express themselves in a clear, concise manner. I guess I was thinking more of the pure um, literacy issue. Right. You know, like in the in the the book, The Reader mm -hmm. by Bernard Schlink right. is you know deals with a, a, a woman who's completely illiterate and is so shamed by it. You know ends up going to prison for her entire life because she doesn't want to admit that she's illiterate. It's like, that's, that's pretty shameful. Um, I don't know. I guess that maybe nowadays, I suppose that, that there are issues with uh, uh, students, high school students, saying, I'll just do enough to get by. Uh, but they're still literate. Um, the question is, how do we raise that literacy mm -hmm. to a higher plateau where they actually enjoy writing and reading and that comes in the 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 energy of the their teachers and the educational system i think and their parents i mean we all have to get involved in in that and and by writers that's why we at seattle 7 do what we do you know we really want to uh to energize people by going out and doing panel discussions and readings and and offbeat stuff that maybe is a little sexy and and kind of hey, what's that about? Let's check it out. Because that's a way to bring people in, and then we can seduce them with our <laughs> literature. And natural good looks. <laughs> uh, and stockades. <laughs> that's, and stockades, exactly. You know, when calculators were introduced, uh, over time it seems that it really degraded people's math skills. Because yes. the second you can actually punch things in and come up with a number, you stop thinking about the actual Absolutely. mechanics of doing it. Do you think that spell check and grammar yes. check things have also uh, ruined literacy? I think that spell check definitely makes people sloppier. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact when I used to work as a uh, an assistant for Philip Langner at the Theater Guild mm -hmm. back in the early '80s, um, uh, and I was typing on an IBM Selectric and doing carbon paper, mm -hmm. you you don't make mistakes because if you do, you got to get out the razor blade and it's a whole thing. So. Uh, I know that with a, with a computer now, I'm typing, typing, I'm always going back because I've made a typo or something. So yeah, you do get sloppy. You do play down to the, to the, to the competition, I think. So I, I had, I'm not sure that's, that's just a discipline problem. That's not a, um, a you know, fundamental problem. Yeah. I just get nervous when I go into like early grades uh, in schools and see more and more computers lined up rather than, you know, actually learning to write by hand or... Type. I know, dude, but you got to we got to change with the world, man. You got to stay hip. All right, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. You be, you're becoming an old man, I, uh, well, Tell me about it. Uh, <laughs> Technophobe. Luddite. I, I'm a Luddite, indeed. <laughs> um, people want to, to know more, and, and they're not going to read about it. Can you recommend any movies? Or if you must, books <laughs> that will movies. help them out. <laughs> oh, God. Are there some books? You know, there's some great. Uh, again, The Reader, I think, is fantastic. Right. Um, and that was a book and a movie. Right, yes. Um, Both will know it as a movie. One of, <laughs> one of my favorites <laughs> Oscar is nominated. Uh, about literacy is Fahrenheit 451 mm -hmm. by Ray Bradbury. Also a movie, right. um, <laughs> which is uh, it's just terrific. Uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, books about literacy of, of all times is Animal Farm, mm -hmm. uh, George Orwell which I think was made into a movie, though I never saw it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I have to admit, the artist... And an Apple commercial. And an Apple commercial. 
<laughs> the Art of Racing in the Rain does touch on issues of literacy because it's told from the point of view of a dog who can't read, right. but is self-educated by television. Right. There you go. I'm saying. That There's would be the book by you, Garth. Uh, uh, and, you know, <laughs> uh, www. Um, and it's being made into a movie, too. So soon people won't even have to read it. They can just see it on DVD <laughs> on their iPhone. Ooh. So those are it. Fahrenheit 451. Fahrenheit 451. Okay. Uh, and, and The, the reader. reader. And Animal Farm. And The Art of Racing in the, the Art of Racing. Oh, and you know uh, Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Web. I love Charlotte's Web for its literary uh, references. <laughs> No, no, seriously. Really? No, I'm gonna oh, it's, go all back. About, it's all about <laughs> propaganda. See, because, right. like, okay, so this spider, like, doesn't even know what she's writing, but right. she writes all these words up there. Okay, so one day she writes some pig up, mm -hmm. up in the farm, in the right. barn, and the farmer comes down, and he looks at it, he's like, wow, that's some pig. And so he goes and gets his wife, and she comes down, and she sa he says, look, this is some pig. Right. And his wife says, I think that's some spider. Right. The spider <laughs> did the writing. Right. And the guy's like, no, no, it's some pig. Look, it says it right there. <laughs> I mean, is that not a poke at propaganda? There you go. Advertising? I never it that way. There yeah, you go. Okay. that's E.B. White just taking a swipe at all <laughs> advertising. <laughs> oh, it says it. It must be true. It is true if I see it on TV, though. See? There, it, it is working. <laughs> Damn it. Well, I was going to recommend Stanley and Iris, uh, if you've ever seen that. It's great because, once again, it, it really does stigmatize illiteracy. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. and you get Robert De Niro as a, a not even a barely functional illiterate. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, a, a, a good film, certainly. So what, what is the one thing you can leave people with? What is the one call to action or the, you know? Well, I think that, uh, you know, um, I think that, w you know, as, as a family guy, um, you know, I always try to set a good example for my kids. And I think that that, you know, you can look at your family as your immediate family or, or a larger scale family. And I think that, you know, showing the fun of reading um, for my kids, discussing books, reading books at the same time as they do, uh, having good discussions about it, or for instance, one of my sons was uh, had to read was assigned to Kill a Mockingbird f uh, over the summer to read. Well, that's great, and you know what? We have a lot, a lot of good discussions about it. And now tonight, we're going to watch the film, which mm -hmm. is a terrific film. Oh. So we, you know, there are ways to 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 uh, kind of culturally tie into our kids, even though we feel that this this technology chasm is so great, right. the technology gap. Um, there's still a way to sort of fake, make it so that my kid says, you know what his thing is now? Great. He says, I'm reading Grace of Wrath. That's my next thing. Wow. And I said, by all means, read it. And that's also a great movie. After you've read it and we discuss it, then let's watch the movie, which is terrific. And then hopefully we can go see the play. They'll redo it at Intamin when they did a great production of it a few years ago. Wow. So I think that, you know, it, Having the discussion, keeping the, the conversation going is always important with our kids, with the communities around us, doing book groups, book clubs, volunteering at schools, libraries, anything that you can do to sort of uh, demonstrate your passion for reading is something that's going to be good. Well, we agree there, certainly, that if you show your passion to mm -hmm. others around you, it helps a lot. I like forcing myself to read in front of my daughter. Uh, not to ignore her, but actually to let her know <laughs> that this is a good way to spend your time. Right. And I always try to remind her that if you want to write a better future for yourself, you have to be able to read the past. So keep after it at wow. all times. Read, consider it a sexy, a sexy thing to do. And come to see the novel live where there will be sexiness. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Garth. Eric, Eric, Eric Larson, put your shirt back on. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, they're coming in droves now. <laughs> <laughs>